All right, we're going to be getting started in just a second or two here. Um, actually, getting started now. So I just want to explain a little bit about the topic before we jump into it, because um, as I was just telling her, this is a topic that is technically in the tra traditional space, media tie-in writing. Um, but that doesn't mean that it is um, exclusively that. And also, it opens up doors for those who want to be hybrid writers as well. So just a quick recap on me, you know, Jonathan Mayberry, you know, author of multiple books and so on. Um, I'm also the president of the Associ International Association of Media Tie-In Writers. It's an organization, our job, you know, we are hired by companies to write stories either that are direct adaptations, like a movie novelization, or to write original works set in those worlds. And there are two, kind, two groups within this. One is the active license group, like if you're writing a Star Wars novel, you are writing under license from Disney and you're working with Disney. And probably the biggest portion of what is well known in media tie-in is active license work. The other side, and it's open to everyone, is expired licenses. So you could, you know, you, you need a license to write a story about Darth Vader. You do not need to have a license to write a story about Dracula. Um, you could write, for example, a Wizard of Oz story set in the first three books, which are now public domain. I think it might even be five books now in the public domain. Um, so by, by doing some research on what characters, uh, you can go to the, the Gutenberg uh, project and a couple other websites um, to find out whether something is in public domain or not and gives you an opportunity. Right now, with our own organization, we're doing a, uh, uh, an anthology called Double Trouble, where all the stories are mashups. So you might have, you know, um, Sherlock Holmes and Captain Nemo in a story, you know, for example. If you're mashing up characters, all of the characters that we, we're picking for that anthology are actual, you know, license free. Because, it, well, the reason we're doing it that way is to try to get permission from all the active license holders to let us do a single story in an anthology would be impossible. Um, it's just never going to happen. So we don't try. We, we just go ahead and write, you know, stories with characters that are free. And I've written in a ton of worlds. My first, actually, my first New York Times bestseller was, in fact, a media tie-in work. Weird, weird way it happened. So I, I was on, I was sick. I had the flu. Um, and when I'm sick, for some reason, I like marathoning monster movies. It's a thing. I just roll with it. So I was talking about, you know, on Facebook saying, you know, I'm really in the mood to watch some werewolf films. Give me some suggestions of some, for something I may not have seen. And I've seen every werewolf film. If it has hairs and, hair and fangs, I've seen it. But it's a great way to start a conversation on Facebook. People start talking about it. Even if I'm not getting new watches, the conversation's happening, which is fine. Um, and you never know who's paying attention to these things. So I get a call the next day from the vice president of licensing at Universal uh, Studios saying that her assistant was following me on uh, social media and saw that I was talking about werewolves. And uh, she said, well, well, we're doing a werewolf film. Have you ever heard of the Wolfman? I was talking about werewolf movies, and you're asking if I... So she said, we're, you know, we're making the remake with Benicio Del Toro, Emily Blunt, Hugo Weaving, and um, uh, Anthony Hopkins. And would you have any interest in writing the novelization of that? Now, I had never done a novelization, though I have read many over the years. Um, my tendency is to say yes first to a new project and then figure out how to do it. It's one of the ways in which I have expanded my career beyond what my original career vision was. Like, when I did my first novel, I was going to be a horror novelist. Now I'm writing all over the damn place. And this was an opportunity to try something new. And of course, you know, I, I do have an agent, so I turn him over to my agent. We got the deal made. And one of the weird things I found out with writing media tie-in is you don't actually get to see the movie. Um, because they're still cutting it. And just, what you get is the script. Maybe, maybe you'll get some production stills, which I did not get. So I got a script um, for a movie and with no guideline on how to do the, you know, this project. And you can't just wrap a paragraph around a line in a, in a script and hope that turns into a novel. And since it was, would have been my fifth 
or sixth novel, I think the sixth, my sixth novel, um, you know, my career was still, you know, fairly young, and I didn't, last thing I wanted to do was have a book come out with my name on it that I didn't feel um, represented my, you know, my brand and, and my skill set. So I, I said, okay, well, if, if, I, if they want me to write a novel, I'm going to write a novel. So I, I did research set in, in, in um, 19th century England. I did research on the clothing, the food, but, and I didn't even know what, what garments they would wear or how the actors would inflect their characters, by the way, or their, their character lines. I had none of that, just the script. So I wrote a gothic novel. I, I, I put my heart and soul into a gothic novel that its skeleton is David Self's script, but the novel is, you know, is substantially different than, than the script. And of course, it's, it's substantially different than the movie. Um, the movie did not do well. It was not a particularly good movie, sadly. I, I had high hopes with that cast. Uh, the novel became a huge bestseller and, you know, surprised everyone. Um, in fact, I, I got an email from uh, Peter Straub. I don't know if you know, he is one of the one of the foundational horror writers of our generation. And um, his new book had come out the same day as the audio book for The Wolfman. And mine debuted at number one and his debuted at number two. And I, you know, Pete and I were old friends. So he just sent me an email that said, fuck you. Okay, fair enough, you know. Um, that launched me into that world and also gave me insight into it. Now, most media tie-in work is not actually novelizing movies. It is writing original material. Um, and I've done this in a lot of different ways, a lot of different projects. One of my, you know, some among the things that I've been asked to do over the years, uh, after doing a book signing at BEA, Book Expo America, next to Charlene Harris, you know, um, she said, oh, you know, we, we became friends, we chatted, and she said, oh, by the way, we're doing an anthology of stories set um, in the world of Sookie Stackhouse, the world of True Blood, would you be interested? And again, my brain, you know, always says, well, sure. And then I figure it out. So I went up, and I had, by the way, only read one of the Sookie Stackhouse books. I had to read the books um, because she wanted them based on the, on the characters as they were presented in the books, not the TV series. So, because HBO had the, had the character license rights. So I went up doing it for that, and it was, it was fun. I had to do some homework. But it was fun. Next project, Max Brooks, a uh, World War Z guy, was editing an anthology for um, IDW Publishing. It was a G.I. Joe anthology. Now, when I was a kid, G.I. Joe was a 12-inch tall World War II action figure, or in the later years, Vietnam, but still. And I didn't, you know, I, all of the, the little G.I. Joe, all the, the you know, greatest American hero stuff, I did not know any of it. I, I was aware that it existed, but knew nothing about it. Um, and since it was a Hasbro project under a Hasbro license, um, Max arranged to have them send me some research materials. And I expected like maybe an email, uh, like a PDF of a story Bible. For those who don't know what a story Bible is, for any series, it's all the basic information, characters, profiles, histories, and also some do's and don'ts, things you can and cannot do. But that's not what arrived. What arrived was a box with DVDs of all the cartoon shows, a whole bunch of the toys and stacks of comic books. So I spent two days doing research, sitting on my living room floor with the toys, watching the cartoons and reading comics. And I, I, that's the point at which, you, you know, you kind of look up and go, I love my job. You know, this, this, is, this is kind of a fun job. Now, it wasn't a hugely, you know, big paying gig, but it was fun and, you know, it was something new. Um, Probably the most influential thing I've done has actually been with an expired license, which is open to anyone, traditional or indie. Um, John Joseph Adams, who's a, a really great anthology anthologist, said he was doing an anthology called Oz Reimagined. It's all tales set in the world of Wizard of Oz. And you can play with the model a little bit. My, and, of course, my inclination being a horror writer, the first thing I wanted to do was write a story where the Tin Man gets the heart of a serial killer and goes on a rampage with his axe, because that would have been fun to write. But as I'm sitting down to literally plot that one out, I realize that, you know, part of what media tie-in is is understanding who the audience is. Little kids read the Oz books. They don't want a gory serial killer 
you know, basically robot story, which is what Tin Man would be. Um, so it would have it, it would have been a misstep for me. It would have. It, you know, the editor might have bought it, it might have been in the anthology, but it would have been one of those, you know, kind of like out of continuity oddball stories rather than something that um, uh, contributed to the actual license or, or the actual world of that. So instead I wrote a story about a little winged monkey girl and in the Oz stories, the winged monkeys were a sentient race who were enslaved by the witch. They were not bad guys and they actually could speak, they had our own, own, their own culture and so on. So I did a story of a little winged monkey girl whose wings were too small for her to fly, so she went and searched for magic traveling shoes that would take her to all the places her wings wouldn't take her. And even as I'm writing this, and mind you, up to this point I had written nothing for kids, not, nothing, all my stuff was adult. Even as I'm writing it, and I'm enjoying it, I'm going, you know, no idea what the hell I was writing, but I was having fun. The story went into the anthology, the anthology came out, and I got, um, well, it was pulled out in a lot of reviews because a lot, a lot of the reviewers said that it, it kind of touched on the, the, the charm, um, which I've never had the word charm associated with my writing up to that point, the charm of the, the original Wizard of Oz books. And then I got a letter a few months later from the estate of L. Frank Baum, the creator of Wizard of Oz, and I was afraid to open it because I'm thinking, oh great, they're going to fry me for messing with their characters. And what it said was that they loved my story so much and they felt it was... Uh, it honored the original stories and kept to that world so well. They are adding it henceforth to the official chronology of Oz. It will always be now one of the prequels to The Wizard of Oz. I may have ugly cried when I read that. Um, now, a couple things about this. First, um, it's media tie-in. So I could have just said no. You know, it's not, my, it's not my wheelhouse. It's not my zone. Why should I try it? And had I done that, that would never have happened. You know, I didn't get paid a tremendous amount, a few hundred bucks for the story, you know, it was, it was, I think it was five cents a word, you know, for that particular anthology. So it's not like I did it for the money, and I certainly didn't expect anything to come out of it other than pleasing my editor and maybe pleasing the readers. But that's the thing you don't know when you try something new. And one of the reasons that I, I, I do like talking about this with indie writers is there are opportunities to do exactly this sort of thing open to you. You don't need to pay for a license. You just need to make sure that the characters you want to use are in fact royalty free. That opens up a lot of doors. You, you know, you can write a Tarzan story as long as it's the events of the first three books. John Carter of Mars, first three books, and so on. <clears throat> now, one important thing, when you search on whether something is license free, you have to be careful because it'll, you'll, you'll get uh, responses that'll pop up saying like things like King Kong and James Bond are license free. Well, they are in Canada. They're not in America. And, you know, unless you're publishing exclusively in Canada with no American edition, um, you're in some trouble. So, I, I, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're doing it with characters that are free. But there are so many characters. Uh, I just recently had a, had a story out in a, in a called, um, the anthology was uh, Classic Monsters Unleashed, edited by James Aquilone. And I wrote a story about uh, the island of Dr. Moreau, kind of a sequel to that story, which was fun for me because I'm a big H.G. Wells fan, and I got to play with that. I've written stories uh, also in the worlds of Hellboy, John Carter of Mars. Um, uh, for those who, who like really bad old 80s horror, Chud. Do anyone remember Chud? There was an anthology of Chud stories, cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers. Awful movie awful in a watchable, enjoyable way, but, but an awful movie. And somebody got, got a budget together and said, let's do that anthology. I've done plenty of Sherlock Holmes stories. I've done um, a lot of Lovecraft stories. In fact, Lovecraft, during his own life, made all of his stuff essentially open source. He allowed every other writer, in fact, the guy who created Conan, who was a correspondent with his, of his, put a lot of H.P. Lovecraft elements in the Conan stories, the early Conan stories. Um, and I like that open source thing. Michael Moorcock, one of my favorite fantasy writers back in the 70s, took one of his characters, Jerry Cornelius, and allowed any writer to write a Jerry Cornelius story. And Norman Spinrad and other people did that. Um, I love being able to play with these creative characters. And in a way, it's almost like a writing prompt. Somebody gives you, you know, whether somebody gives you the idea or you say, hey, this character's free, and then you start thinking, what would I write with that character? 
Um, I just did a, a, a comic book script, 15 page comic book script, for a graphic novel of Carl Kolchak's stories, The Night Stalker. I love that, that license, you know, got to play with that. And I've done stuff with um, licenses that, you know, are so bizarrely uh, obscure that most people wouldn't think there would be enough interest. There was somebody come at me a few years ago to do a, a story for a Plan 9 from Outer Space anthology. It was plans one through, through eight. Um, so I actually did one set in Vegas, Plan 7 from, from, Sin, City, uh, from Sin City, yeah. Um, these sorts of things stretch you creatively. You go outside your comfort zone. You try playing with somebody else's toys. And as a result, you have to um, be able to honor the source material while still bringing in, bringing in creative originality because you don't want to do just another cut and paste version of one of those stories. You want to bring something new to it without challenging the boundaries of the license. Now, actually, Brian over here, Brian Thomas Schmidt, wait, raise your hand. Uh, he and I have uh, edited, uh, we have an anthology out now, uh, Aliens versus Predator, those two franchises. Um, when we were working with the writers and getting the pitches, sometimes writers would come up with a pitch that was so far outside the the world of it, it's almost like they just wanted to cut and paste the word alien or predator into the story. Those weren't stories that we, we wanted to publish. So we, would make, we wanted to encourage the writers to understand the actual license and go further and, and add something to it that is um, original and, un, and interesting enough for it to stand along with and hopefully be accepted as canon within that license. Um, Sherlock Holmes is probably the most frequently used uh, open license character. Everyone writes Sherlock Holmes stories. It's almost like a rite of passage if you're a writer. You have to do a Sherlock Holmes story. And, you know, I have friends who, who have been in Sherlock Holmes versus Cthulhu anthologies. Sherlock Holmes uh, dealing with the invaders from Mars from, uh, uh, what the hell's that story? H.G. H, uh, H. Wells, what I'm, War of the Worlds. God, I can't believe I blanked on that. I must not have had enough caffeine. Um, people have written all sorts of Sherlock Holmes stories. I just had a Sherlock Holmes story come out uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it was a horror Sherlock Holmes anthology. Uh, Charles Prepelak just thought, wanted to do an anthology where all the Sherlock Holmes stories were hor actual horror stories because in the Sherlock Holmes published works, the original ones, Holmes, every time Holmes uh, got up against something that appeared to be supernatural, which was kind of the charm of the story, like Hound of the Baskervilles or the, or the Sussex Vampire, it turned out not to be. But he, this editor wanted to say, wanted to do something that would please him, so he wanted to, put, he wanted to make sure every story was, in fact, supernatural. Um, a lot of these anthologies start as Kickstarters. Somebody has an idea, maybe, you know, there's not a publisher who can fund it right now, and you know we're in a recession right now, so that's that's not an uncommon thing. But they like the idea enough, so they want to kickstart it and see if there's enough interest, which is a great way, by the way, of gauging interest and also paying for the, the book. So by the time the kickstart is funded, you know all the contributors are getting paid, the editors are getting paid, everything's getting covered, the, the, and it's print on demand, so we're good. But it's a great way for an indie author to become an indie publisher. Um, by, by becoming the editor of that. Uh, quite a few small presses that exist out, now, uh, out there now started out as indie writers who wanted to band together to, to combine to publish, you know, whether, whether they create a, you know, a house label and under which each of them can publish their works, or to do things like anthologies, like, like what Charles Prepperlich uh, did with uh, uh, the Sherlock Holmes. It's a fantastic way of, of going a little deeper into the, the indie business to, you know, it, you're putting a toe over the line in, into traditional, but who cares? You know, you're still, it's your publishing house. Um, by having a, a, maybe a small, a label for it that isn't your actual name, it bypasses some of the resistance reviewers might have in reviewing the book. It bypasses some of the resistance bookstores might have in stocking the book. Um, it, it just allows you to, to move into another area without having to stop being the, the indie writer that, that you want to be and that you, you've become. It just adds another dimension to it. it it's that bridge between indie, it, traditional, it's hybrid, but it's, it's really hybrid-leaning indie.
is how it works. And by the way, if anybody has any questions, the mic is over there. Please feel free to ask questions on any of this. One of the, the ways to find out where these markets are, if you want to, say, find an anthology that's doing open license stuff, or a market that's doing traditionally licensed stuff, but it's open to all people willing to pitch, there are a couple different, easy, a couple different ways. The easiest is to um, do, a, say, a Google search, put in the word guidelines, the topic. So if, say, Sherlock Holmes guidelines, and then set the search uh, for maybe no more than nine months back. Uh, if you go any later, it's probably, it might be an expired anthology that's already passed its, its submi submission date. But by doing this, what you find is the guidelines will pull up submission guidelines. You know, that, that's a nice little keyword. And you find out who's offering, uh, who's doing what. Or you can go to something like Raylan.com, R-A-L-A.com, which has terrific market listings updated all the time. And some of, they range from for the love of it, meaning you're not getting paid but you're getting published, all the way up to pro rates and a lot of different iterations in between. So you can find anthologies that are doing this. You can, and here's the thing, here's the fun part about this. If you get a story in an anthology, whether it is indie published, traditionally published, or whatever, that story is not only read by uh, the editor of that, it is read by, sometimes there's a publisher who the editor is either freelancing for or working directly for. Brian and I uh, did the our anthology for Titan. So you're getting on their radar as well. You're getting on the radar of every other contributor because a lot of times the contributors will read the other stories in the anthology and there are usually some marquee names. So you get on the, on the, on the, the uh, uh, radar of some maybe more established persons in the business, that becomes good contact. You can, you can you know, friend them on social media you, you know, because you now you have a common, common ground with the anthology, get to know them and that builds your network of people in all aspects of the biz. Um, those are good things. You also, because of the marquee names that, uh, you know, that the editor will have picked, usually those are curated rather than open call. Um, the marquee names will get it on, on reviewers uh, radar and uh, bookstore radars and so on. I've been in, you know, when I first started out, before I was one of the names that they would put on the cover, um, I would jump at, at an anthology that had one of my favorite writers in there I wanted that writer to read my stuff, you know, unabashedly. I, Peter S. Beagle was in an anthology. I was in, of course I wanted him to read my stuff. I loved his, you know, I read all his stuff. Um, this builds your presence, the awareness of you as a brand. It builds it more strongly within the writing community. And when I talk about the community, I am not talking about traditional or indie. I'm talking about all of it because it is one community. Um, it helps validate you in your own eyes because and I've had this conversation with a lot of my friends who are indie. Um, they often feel that they, because they're indie, they are not being taken seriously. And you guys, some of you guys, I'm sure, have, have encountered this because of the old prejudices against indie that are still lingering despite the fact that they have very little substance you know, to validate. Um, but we want to we wanna be validated. We want to be validated by our peers. We would like to be validated by, by uh, people we admire, you know. And we want to be validated by the readers who might not have found our stuff, but might have found the, our story in an anthology because there is a name that they are following. Like, for example, if, there, if there's an anthology that has a Joe, Led, a Joe Lansdale story. Joe is one of my best friends. I love his writing. I will read anything he's done. If he's in an anthology, I'm going to read the anthology, and I'm going to read the whole anthology because I want to see who else is there. And very often, what you'll have, and, and this is something uh, I and my fellow editors often try to do, is we want to amplify voices that are underrepresented, that are not heard as well. And sometimes that's you guys. Um, I've found so many wonderful writers from the indie community that I've used in Weird Tales magazine, which I edit, um, in the 22 anthologies that I've done. I'm working on two more right now. Um, a lot of the folks who are in there are writers who may not have had a traditional sale or a sale in a market that's going to get them noticed by a broader audience, but now they have that as well, as well as what they are doing to, to uh, drive their own career with their own marketing strategies and so on. It adds more amplification to what you are already doing to be noticed, and that can sell your backlist of stuff that you have already independently published. 
because if, if somebody reads a story and they really like it, really like it, they're going to want to read more of that writer. And if they find that that writer's got you know, X number of books available on Amazon or wherever else you're selling, or through your own website, they're going to say, wow, you know, that's reasonably priced books. Let me go grab something. And that's how you, you know, it, it increases your fan base. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. Also, um, quite a few of my friends who write media tie-in work started out um, doing a kind of indie that doesn't pay, which is called fan fiction. You guys are familiar with fan fiction. Fan fiction doesn't pay. You cannot legally sell fan fiction. So if you were to write a story set in the world of, say, the, the uh, Supernatural TV show, and you, and you put it up on Amazon, even for 99 cents, you'll be hearing from the lawyers, because you can't do that. Um, but fan fiction, you can, you can publish it for free, and it's fun, it's great. A lot of the folks I know started out writing fan fiction. Um, Nancy Holder, Christopher Golden, a bunch of other folks started writing fan fiction, and that became the bridge. Nancy Holder and Christopher Golden was, were doing Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan fiction and got picked up to write Buffy the Vampire Slayer actual paid work, um, which, and, and that, that launched careers. I mean, they're, they're, they're both hugely successful. Um, my buddy, uh, Keith DeCandido, is a, a good example of a hybrid writer. He publishes a lot of his own fiction because it's stuff that an editor at a traditional house would probably want him to change in ways that go contrary to his desire for the story. So he publishes that himself. But at the same time, he also edits anthologies and does media tie-in work to drive his career forward. He's driving in both lanes at the same time, and as a result, he is never short of work. Uh, whether it's something he's choosing to do or whether something, you know, I've used him in God knows how many anthologies. Um, it, it, it just builds the, the potential to have your work out there. And a little side note, and you've probably been told some version of this by a lot of folks at conventions like this, your book is not your brand. You are the actual brand. The book is a byproduct of the brand. So as many, if you're trying to build your brand, every possible opportunity you have to publish is something you should consider whether it is indie, hybrid, traditional, um, whether it is prose or graphic, you know, there's lots of different ways to do it, audio originals, you know, however you want to do it, there are lots of opportunities for you to express that. A mistake is when you focus a little too much on just the one book. Yes, you need to market the hell out of the book. Granted, we all do, whether, whether it's traditional or, or, or indie. But if your focus is your book, if your social media is named after that book, if your website is named after that book, you're actually doing a disservice to your own brand. We want, you know, we in the, in, in the anthology business, the magazine business, which is you know, a big part of what I do, we're looking for people who understand that they are the brand. We want their names in our book. We don't want to, you know, the book, if they're going to be in, say, an uh, Aliens versus Predator book or some other book, I, I don't want that to be, um, I don't want that to be a missed opportunity for someone. I want them to say, yeah, I do this, this is my stuff, I do this, I do this, I do this. And all of those things open up potential opportunities. Uh, I have gotten a ton of work just by appearing in anthologies. And it's kind of a weird thing. I've published 138 short stories so far. I have never actually pitched one. Um, they've all been invitation things. Because I started off in anthologies and, you know, you give your best work to that short short fiction. I mean, you don't just write a story to write a story. You really put your heart and soul into it. That, that degree of passion shows, really does show. Even if the story is dark, your excitement, your joy in, in the writing of it, your manipulation of language and so on shows through, and that becomes attractive to other editors, and editors read anthologies. We read everybody else's anthologies because we want to we want to steal their writers. You know. Um, I do it for Weird Tales, that's for damn sure. You know, I, I, I go through anthologies and I say, wow, that story was awesome. I need that guy to work for me and hire him for an anthology. So, um, we're, we have 13 minutes still. Que if you have a question, just go over to the mic for a sec, please, because we want to be able to get the questions on, on uh, the recording this with the questions as well. Do it by the mic in a second. So we have to come. Okay. We're no, it's fine. I'm just going to add. Just something he didn't specifically say that I thought would be helpful to you. If you can get in an anthology with one of your comps, 
one of the people who you think your fan base would, their fan base would like you, which is possible, you can pick up a lot of fans. It's oh, just, yeah. It's one of the hugest advantages you have, and a lot yeah. of people do that. So Absolutely. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I hope you'll forgive me for beating Guy, but could you repeat the name of that lookup for short stories? Ray Lynn? Ray Lynn, R A L A N. Dot com. A L A N. Dot com, yeah. Okay. It's one of the two better market listings, and it's free. The other one is Duotrope, D U O T R O P E. That's a pay site. There is a free version of it, but it's not as, as up to date. I found Raylan to be the most useful market uh, resource. And also, um, going to the websites of, say, the Horror Writers Association, Mystery Writers Association, often they have market listings on there. And, and um, there are membership opportunities in all of those organizations, like I'm with the Horror Writers Association. Indie writers are absolutely welcome, not only to join the organization, but also to qualify for the Bram Stoker Awards that we give out. And so by joining the organization, you get access to the website, and there's, uh, every, every month there's a newsletter that has market listings in there. And I've, I, in the past, I've put some of my own anthology uh, uh, pitch calls in there. So, all right, what else do we have for questions? You must have questions. This is, you're coming to a, to a talk. Really? It's just my charming personality and boyish good looks? That's what it is? Okay. So, go, I have other things to say on this subject, so I'm going to dive right back in. Um, media tie-in is also an interesting creative challenge, because I've, I've done it in prose and I've also done it in comics. I, I wrote for Marvel Comics for quite a few years. Um, among the things that, 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 that happen is you get handed a project or you take on a project that has a significant amount of backstory. Like when the first time I wrote for Marvel, the first character they gave me to, to do a story on was Wolverine. And you know, Wolverine has been written by a zillion writers, and there is a certain default setting to his personality, certain limits to his abilities, and so on, that have been explored in various ways. Um, you can tell the stories written by people who really understand the character and those written, uh, who are written by people who don't. And usually there are errors in, in the continuity of the character. I like doing my homework with it. Now, I hadn't read comics since about 1990, and I got this offer in 2008. I had to go do research. I had to read a lot of Wolverine stuff. Found out there are Wikipedia pages or wikis for almost everything that's popular. Every pop culture thing out there has a wiki. We use the Alien and, Pred and Predator wikis a lot when we were editing our anthology. And we also referred our writers to them because fans are often a lot more detail-oriented and accurate than, than we writers are. Yeah, exactly. Um, so so when, when doing a, a comic or doing a character like that, you, you want to honor what was done before and bring new, new stuff to it. Um, I saw one of the big effects of that quite recently. Some of you already know about this. Um, I had, I'd been the writer of the Black Panther comic for two years. And I did the comic right when Shuri became the Panther for the first time, back in 2008 and 9, 8, 9, and 10. Um, I wrote the first full run of her as, as the Black Panther, and I wrote the run where she fought Namor. Um, the, in that run, I also created a group uh, of Dora Milaje called the, the Midnight Angels. Now, the movie that's, that's just out now has a character I created named Anika, who was, um, I created, she was, one of the gen, she was a general of the Dora Milaje. The Midnight Angels, Originally, characters have now become a new generation of body armor, combat armor, and the big fight scene that I wrote in my comic between Shuri and Namor is, is, is the big fight scene at the end of the movie. All of that's out of my comics. Um, when I wrote that comic, I wrote that comic to honor the legacy of the character, but also to add new material. Um, some writers will, will pick up a book and they'll do just another adventure. But you don't, you want to leave your mark on it. So I created new characters. I created new situations, not to replace the ones that were there, but to be able to add to that legacy, be part of that legacy. And in fact, in, in the end of my run, I had, uh, uh, since the, the ultimate villain of the series was Dr. Doom, uh, I had uh, all of the processed vibranium in Wakanda destroyed at the end of the book. Uh, for reasons that make sense in the book. Um, after that, my run was done, the guy who was writing the Spider-Man comic 
was, was told by, by Marvel that we, you know, now that the Wakandan vibranium is destroyed, we need, until they can process more, we need uh, uh, artificial vibranium. So that it became a subplot in the Spider-Man comic written by someone else. My Anika character and my Dora Milaje uh, special ops group, Minute Angels, were picked up by other writers who took my storylines and continued on with it. So if you write something that matters, other writers are going to want to be able to take your stuff and continue working with it. And that becomes extraordinarily fun. Um, I also am actually the, the holder of two, two licenses of my own. One is called V Wars, which was adapted into a Netflix show. Um, it was a shared world anthology. I created a framing story, and I invited individual writers to come in and write like field reports in it. So each of the four volumes of it um, were uh, you know, a 50,000 word framing story and then a whole bunch of like about 70,000 words worth of short stories by other writers. And that allowed, I mean, some of those characters, some of the stories written by the other people, when, this, when Netflix developed it into a show, some of the other people had their characters folded into the show and got thanked in the acknowledgments, which became big career hits for them. Um, the other one I have is Joe Ledger, my, the, the main character of my thriller series. Uh, Brian and I, the first project I think we did together was Joe Ledger Unbreakable, which is an anthology of stories set in the, the world of Joe Ledger. We had uh, Steve Alton, who, created, who wrote Meg, that the movie was based on. He wrote a whole series of those books. Un yeah, un that's right, Joe Ledger Unstoppable was first. We're working on Joe Ledger Unbreakable, the second one now. But we had all these, these stories by notable writers in there um, who bring their own fan base you know, to bear. Uh, he's also done one with uh, Larry Correa, who's, who's at the same conference, with his Monster Hunter International. And I wound up writing a story for it, which becomes fun. And you can see that this gets a little inbred after a while. If you, if you become one of those writers that, A, is willing to try new things, is B, willing to work within guidelines, C, is willing to add substance to it while working within guidelines, and D, most importantly, is not a jackass, really important thing, um, you get invited to play with other people's toys a lot. Um, I know, the writers I know who are easy to work with are the ones who get work all the time. And you, you, you get known, you know, because editors tell stories about problem writers over cocktails. We've done it. Um, but we also tell stories to each other and, and, and make recommendations to each other about writers, however big or small their career uh, wattage is at the moment, We'd say, you know, I just worked with this guy you, or this woman. You may not have heard of him or her, but man, this person can really write. Um, and, you know, they'll say, well, what is he or she published? And you say, well, you know, it, it's not a lot. Or you say, well, it's mostly indie stuff. Um, you know, here's some titles you should check out because it's badass. And the other, writer, the other editor will go look and say, wow, this is somebody I should, I should also grab. And you wind up getting picked up in kind of that, that rising tide um, by other editors who see your worth. And it doesn't matter. Your sales numbers do not really matter to the editor who's looking for good writers. It may matter if you're, if you're editing for, like, say, Titan, and they're all about the bestseller. But we managed to sneak in some people who, are, who aren't necessarily you know, household names, but were damn good writers. And yeah, yeah, Suzanne Lambert in AVP was, was uh, indie. So the idea is, we start, you know, we, if we have our marquee names, we then start looking for the writers who can write stuff that we haven't seen before. And one of the things that, that people keep mentioning about the indie world is, because you guys aren't bound by a lot of the, the editorial constraints that happens in traditional publishing, your, the, your tendency is to write outside the box anyway. That's deeply appealing to editors. Question. Um, how do you personally balance it? I know you do so many different things. In one day, will you work on two different projects? Or how do you, how do you, where do you do the stop and start? Well, yeah, that, that's uh, the short version of that is um, I budget everything in terms of time, and I put it on my calendar. Um, so if, like, I write a novel every three months, right, on average. And I write about 10, 15 short stories a year. I, I do some, some comic book work, and I edit anthologies, and I edit a magazine. All of that takes time. I have to figure out by doing and by paying attention to my process, what, uh, how much time each increment of, of work takes. So if I know that I can knock out a short story in two days, I need to budget two to three days for that short story because I need the time to write it and to revise it. 
um, those days might happen in the middle of a novel. Well, it certainly will happen in the middle of a novel. So I've got to budget that. I know it's coming, and because I know it's coming, I don't need to worry about it until it gets there. Like, as soon as I finish the book I'm writing right now, which I'll finish by the end of next week, I have a, a story for a Shakespeare horror anthology, Shakespeare Unleashed. Um, I already budgeted the time. I have spent some time in my non-writing hours doing the research for it by rereading The Tempest, watching The Tempest movie, because those are my characters. And now I'm ready to write the story. But I'm waiting for the date that's on my calendar for me to do that bit of work. Now, I also, you know, I, I went from writing part-time most of my life to being a full-time novelist. So as a day job and running a business, I now have to make sure that I'm, a, I'm good at my job in terms of efficiency. So that if I, I, you know, as much as I would love to watch old 80s rock videos on YouTube all day long, um, I can't do that. I have to do work. I did, I did a talk this morning, I went up to my, my room and wrote 2,000 words, and now I'm down talking to you guys. That's what writers do. When, when you're committed to, to building a career, not just selling, but a career, you have to approach it as it is a small business that you are the sole proprietor and the workforce of, and you gotta haul ass to get it because there are people working harder than you, you are. You've gotta work as hard or harder than them be, be, otherwise, you're, you're coming in second, third, or fourth when, when it's an editor's choice. It's paying attention to your process and figuring out how you efficiently get work done. That's what matters. And it is an ongoing thing. It'll change constantly. My first novel took me three and a half years to write. I did a 217,000-word epic fantasy novel in, in uh, uh, 91 days at the beginning of this year. You learn from your process, not only just in, in scheduling, but also in the efficiency with which you do your creative work as well. Uh, when I was working day jobs, I was working bodyguard you know, work and, and, and doing something else. Sometimes I could only write a page a day, but I wrote a page every day. At the end of, a, end of 10 days, I had an, a magazine article written. You know, it's, it's all about being efficient with your, with your work, not fooling yourself, and also not, and this will be the last thing I'll close on because we're out of, almost out of time, not mythologizing the process of being a writer. You're not sitting there waiting for the muse to hit you. You're not waiting for um, the, you know, the right angle of sunlight, your cat laying in a certain position before you can write. The hell with that crap, put your ass in a chair and write, fix it in the rewrite. And that advice works for every single writer that's out there if they want to get ahead. Writing is an art, publishing is a business. Be good at both. And we're, that, that is the end of our talk. So thank, thank you guys, you. good questions. If you have more questions, I'll be around. And if you have questions after today, take my business card, drop me an email, or message me on Facebook. I will answer your questions. Uh, if it's email, put 20 books in the subject bar so I know it's from this. So you, you know, I'll answer, be looking for that over the next few weeks and answer those questions first. So if you need a card, grab a card. Thank you.